and welcome to this Tech Talk. My name is Eileen Hay and I will be talking about uh, creating complex synthetic test data. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about test data and synthetic data in general to begin with and then I will explain the main process I have used while creating synthetic test data for part of the public sector here in Norway. I will then explain a case I have prepared and go through each step of my process more in detail so you can get a more in-depth understanding of the process itself. So uh, if you're ready, let's begin. So why is test data important? Well, test data is the input feed you use to test an application or system. It gives you a good indication of whether your system performs as it should. It can be used simply to maybe just confirm a single result or to challenge the ability of your system. And also it can help you identify problems during fixes. So it's easy to see why having test data is an important part of any development process. It will help ease your development and probably help you quick, much quicker create what you want. Uh, if you look at like previously, sharp data has often been used as test data. And when I say sharp data, I mean real production data. However, because of privacy policies such as GDPR, using sharp data that contains personal or sensitive information is no longer a valid option for test data. Um, which means we now have to think outside the box on what kind of data we can use as test data. And when thinking about trying to find out what we can use, we still need to think about the needs of test data, uh, which can be summarized uh, like this. First of all, because of the privacy policies, all test data needs to comply with them. We need to make sure that no privacy policies are broken while we ha work with our test data. In addition, any test data need to be realistic. We need to have data that is as similar as possible to the data that your system will be handling. Otherwise, you won't get a realistic um, indication of whether or not your system works as it should. Uh, we should also have test data that contains some edge cases, some data with extreme parameters, again, to see how your system reacts to extreme data. Uh, in addition, dirty data could also be a need mistakes are made and sometimes data contains mistakes, some invalid values, and your system might need to handle those invalid values. Uh, and another part that is very important, at least I think, with test data is that it needs to be cost effective. Because today you have a larger need for automated tests, you have a larger need for performance tests. And then having test data readily available and is very important. It can't take time uh, to create a test data when you need it quickly. Uh, so those are all different test data needs that you have to take into consideration on what kind of test data you are going to use. Uh, so there are several options for test data today. Uh, I already talked a little bit about sharp data, which is no longer a good idea because of the privacy concerns. In addition, sharp data rarely uh, contains edge cases. Um, so we can actually just disregard sharp data as an option if you're working with test data that has sensitive information. Uh, another option is mask data, which is simply sharp data where certain parameters has been uh, replaced by pseudonyms. Uh, this should give some privacy, but it is often still possible to identify people based on the other parameters that hasn't been masked. So there are still several privacy concerns with mass data, and just like sharp data doesn't have any edge cases, even though it would be realistic and cost effective to use. And then we have anonymous data, uh, which is where we usually use a step-by-step -step process to anonymize sharp data. And this gives some better privacy than most. However, any process to anonymize data can be reversed. So there is always a potential privacy concern with anonymous data. And in addition, just like Sharp the Mask, they rarely have uh, edge cases. Then we get to the last one here I'm going to talk about, is, which is custom-made data. 
which doesn't have any privacy concerns because you're creating it yourself or through an automatic process. So there should be no sensitive information there. Uh, and in addition, uh, it is the problem is that even with custom-made data, it's usually not very realistic because you're making it yourself. And if you're going to make uh, massive amounts of data, it's not very cost-effective and will maybe kind of pause the development phase because you're still waiting on that custom-made data to be created. So what do we do? What is our best option here? Well, that's our topic of the day, which is synthetic test data. And a brief explanation of what synthetic test data is, that it is about providing realistic and comprehensive test data without compromising privacy. And it is the privacy key part here that is key, because if you looked at the previous types of data, often there are privacy concerns. And with synthetic data, or in our case, machine learning based synthetic data, uh, the data is synthetic and it doesn't contain any real private information. Uh, and it is also, if you've done it correct, it is realistic. And when you have everything set up, it's easy to create as much data as you need. Uh, so to summarize why we should use synthetic data, as I said, it complies with privacy policies, which is very important today. In addition, it is realistic because when we use machine learning uh, methods to create models that can generate the data, the machine learning model is trained on usually anonymized data, uh, which means that if the model is correct, the data will be realistic. And once the model is created, it is cost effective to create as much data as you need. It's just generate new as needed. But again, because it is synthetic data is originally based on uh, master or sharp data, it doesn't include edge cases. That's the one negative part of synthetic data. But in my experience, it's very easy to combine synthetic data with custom made data when needed, which isn't always the case, but it is possible, so that way you actually cover all of the main needs for test data. But how do you create synthetic test data? Well, that's what I'm going to explain now. This is my main process that I use whenever I'm giving a new system or application that needs test data. The first step in this process is to analyze the problem or the system. What are the components of the system? What kind of needs for test data are there? Uh, you need to understand the entire system and how it works to really understand what the needs are, and that's important. The next step is to uh, get some anonymized sharp data. Uh, this is to ensure that we comply with privacy policies as well as we're able to. If we use anonymized data, then we ensure that we don't get any private information uh, astray. We can ensure that when we're working with our data set and like processing it, that no sensitive information gets to anybody they shouldn't. Then in our third step is my favorite step, because it's the synthesized step. This is where we actually use machine learning methods to create the models we use to generate the data. And there is no one solution on how to do this. This is where you have to be a little bit creative and again, think about the needs you discover during the analysis step. Um, but usually you find a way. And then the last step is to distribute, or the last two steps are to distribute and update the data, which is simply that make sure that your new generated test data is available in the necessary system at regular intervals. So that is my main process for creating synthetic test data. Uh, for you all to get a better understanding of it, because this is quite a simplified explanation, I have prepared a Example case of a system that I have worked on previously to create test data before. Uh, and this case is as follows. Uh, it is a caseworker system. 
where a person can uh, send an application to receive benefits. And based on that application, uh, benefit data is sent to the caseworker system. Uh, either this application is approved and there is a benefit start. And if it has started, then it could change and eventually end. In addition, this caseworker system checks the personal and income information of the applicant to ensure that the data they receive is correct. Uh, so this is, as I said, this is a simplified version of a real system that I have worked on. So following our main process, I will go through all the five steps and talk about how I, what I did in each one with regards to this caseworker system. Step one, as I said, this is the analysis step where we analyze the existing system and identify the need for synthetic data. Uh, what is really most important here, and I can't emphasize this enough, is to get the functional knowledge, get as much functional knowledge as you can. It really is key for understanding your system because you need to know what kind of data the system receives to actually understand whether or not your synthetic test data is good enough. So usually we ask ourselves again, what kind of system does the, what kind of data does the system receive? Is machine learning necessary? Which is a relevant question. Not all test data needs need machine learning. Uh, again, where is realistic data needed? And are there any restrictions on data? Uh, usually, the way we did, did it, or does it, is that we set up uh, regular meetings with um, developers and end users of the system, the people who are going to use our test data. Uh, and we usually have weekly meetings, ask a bunch of questions, get to know our data and our system. And in addition, we read a lot of uh, documentation. Again, you need to understand the problem. Uh, and in our case, we learned several things about this caseworker system. Uh, firstly, we learned that the main test data that they needed was the benefit data. Uh, we did not have to think about the application. It was just a simply, simple notification that a person with a specific ID had applied for something. Uh, the benefit data was what they really needed. And we learned that there were three types of benefits that this caseworker system um, received. We're just going to call them benefit type A, B, and C. And each one of these could start, change, and end. But that was the main test data that they needed, the different types of benefits. And as I mentioned, they also needed to be able to check two databases they had for the personal and income information of the applicant. Because if uh, benefits started and the data has been sent to the caseworker system, they check the personal and income information. And if, for example, the income was too high and this person should not have been receiving this benefit, the caseworker system just rejected the data. Uh, so we need to ensure that the benefit data coincided that it was correct when compared to the personal and income information of any applicant. Uh, in addition, we also learned that an applicant could have several different types of benefits in a row. And it was really that the caseworker system got the benefit uh, data and there wasn't any previous data. Of course, it happens for new applicants, but often uh, the applicant also had previous benefits in the system. So what the caseworker system really need was a sequence of benefits. Uh, this sequence could look a little bit like this. Over time, an applicant would get, uh, would start receiving benefits of type A, and then C, A, B. This is just an example of a sequence of data. Uh, however, there were rules to this sequence. Uh, usually, one type of benefit couldn't uh, we couldn't start with one type of benefit. A always had to be first, for example. And based on that, they could only have certain benefits after it. Uh, 
So in addition to the different benefit types, we realized we needed also to find a way to synthesize the sequence of data we needed to send in. We couldn't just get, just send in random sequences. We needed a um, realistic sequence. So that was an additional test data need that we discovered. Uh, so after we have discovered all of this, we decided to split the different components we discovered into two types. We have the synth machine learning components, uh, which was the benefit types, A, B, and C, and the benefit sequence, and the data that will, or the non-machine learning components that didn't need any machine learning, which was the application, which we could actually just disregard, but we still needed a way to create the personal income information. However, because the system only checked these values, uh, for most part, they could just be default values. You didn't need to have a certain address, for example, to receive benefits, but you needed, certain, needed to be in a certain age range. Uh, and the same for income. The only value there that was relevant was the income, specific income value, not where you worked or anything like that. Uh, so for most part, for those, we needed default values, but all this information needed to be connected to a synthetic ID. And you can say the same for the benefit data. There was, they would be connected to a synthetic ID. So what we needed was actually to create also a synthetic person. Uh, like I said, this synthetic person would be represented by an ID we created and it needed personal and income information. After this was set up, it needed to be connected to any generated synthetic test data that we created on behalf of this synthetic applicant. Uh, so that was the main parts that we discovered, the main needs of the system. We needed to create several machine learning models and synth components, but there were also some parts that we could use default values for. Uh, so after this, uh, after we had analyzed our system, we started to move on to the next step. Uh, this was, of course, to anonymize the data, uh, which is where all identifiable fields are removed and any rare data occurrences are removed after anonymization in case they can be connected to specific persons. Uh, usually, uh, what we do is that we ask whoever are providing us with the data to anonymize it for us. This is because usually there are different standards of anonymization depending on which organization you're working for and making the people who are providing us the data, making them anonymize this for us, ensured um, that we as developers didn't see any sensitive information we weren't supposed to. So it was just another, again, step to ensure that the privacy uh, was contained. Um, but we always look through the data we receive, even though it is anonymized. Uh, the data could be, like in our case, we got uh, CSV files. And uh, for one of the benefit types, there were, I think, 50 plus columns of data. And that's a lot of data and thousands of rows. But we still take a look through it to ensure that there are any that there aren't any sensitive information that has been left in because sometimes there are mistakes. I haven't experienced mistakes in the anonymization, but we try to make sure that it is as correct as possible before we move on to the next step, uh, which is step three, to synthesize. Uh, as I mentioned, this is my favorite part because this is where we train one or more machine learning models to generate the synthetic test data that we need. Uh, we, of course, train our models based on the anonymized data that we received. And the most important part to note here is that I said one or more machine learning models, because rarely is only one necessary. Um, so how do we do this? Well, uh, if you look at this figure, this is a brief explanation or how we create our machine learning or synth components. We have our anonymized data, which we pre-process. Again, uh, this is uh, where we remove any uh, 
identifiable fields. Even though the data is anonymized, we don't need, for example, the column of the anonymized IDs. They can be removed. That's not something we want to synthesize. And we also make sure that the data is in a format that we can use because usually we get so many different kinds of data. It could be XML files or CSV files and so forth. So we need to make it into a format that we can use for machine learning. So we had, in our case, with the caseworker system, we had three types of benefits. And what we tried to use first for our machine learning method was actually something we, a tool we call Bean or Beyond Anonymous, which is a machine learning tool created by and developed by Visma. Uh, this tool is quite good because what it does is that it analyzes uh, the data and finds dependencies between the columns. And based on this information, it creates uh, either a sampling method or a decision tree uh, for each one of these columns. And all these models then, or decision trees, are combined into one to create one machine learning model for that specific data set. Uh, this tool uh, is, of course, developed in Python uh, using uh, the Psychic Learn library. And uh, this is usually the tool we use whenever we, we try to use, whenever we're giving a new data set to synthesize. Uh, it's very good to use when you just need an instance of data, which is, was the case for our benefits. We just needed to generate a type A or B or C. So we used Bean here to create models, one for each four benefit A, B, and C. So that was what we did for the benefit data. However, we had a slight problem with the sequence of benefits. Um, in this case, we needed a historical data in a way because we needed a list of benefits that went back in time. Um, so Bean was not very optimal for this problem. Uh, so we had to think outside the box. We had to look at uh, other machine learning methods that we had used in other cases, uh, like Extreme Random Forest, which we tried first or looked at, but found that was not relevant for our historical data. We then looked at character recurrent neural network. Uh, this is a machine learning method that we have used previously to create historical data. Uh, uh, we used it in other case to create work history. So we knew that it could be used very well to create historical data. Uh, what it does, what it is, is that it is a um, machine learning method that we have actually created using in Python using PyTorch. And the model generates a string of letters where each letter uh, represents a change in data. So what we tried to do was to create a string of letters where each letter was the type of benefit. And the sequence was a valid sequence of benefits. We tried this for uh, sometimes, but we couldn't get the parameters to work correctly, uh, which is always a challenge with any neural network, which is like character recurrent neural networks. Usually there are several features and parameters and you have to get the optimal um, values for them. And it can be tricky. And we found like in this case that we couldn't find the correct features needed for our uh, case um, sequence of benefits. So again, we had to start thinking outside the box. We couldn't use Bean or any other decision trees because it was historical data. And Extreme Random Forest, just like that, couldn't either be used. We tried a basic neural network as well, but couldn't get the features to work. But then we realized the data we had received for our sequence of benefits was basically just uh, historical data for the last two years of the sequences that had been submitted to the caseworker system. There wasn't actually any sensitive or personal information here. There wasn't any uh, personal information that could uh, be used. It was all basically which benefits had come in in which sequence. So technically found out that machine learning wasn't necessary in this part. 
So what we decided to do was to actually create um, a sampling method. We stored our data set that we had, anonymized data set that we had received, which actually didn't contain any anonymized data because there was no sensitive data, and then simply sampled it as needed. And that was good enough because it was realistic. It was examples of uh, sequences that had gone through the system. Uh, so then we had our models, the last model we needed here. We had our benefit types and we had our sequence of data. And all these models were then stored in uh, our model database. Um, and what we did that was that we actually had all of these uh, SYN components were actually, we created one for each of our benefits. I didn't quite say that earlier, but um, we actually created an application for each of our models. That way um, we could have one place or an application that could train the model as needed, but the application could also receive requests for data. And when it received the request for data, it uploaded the necessary model and generated data and returned it. Uh, so we got, in the end, we had, as I said, there were four different synth components or application, one for benefit type A, one for benefit type B, and one for benefit type C. And the last one was for the sequence of benefits. Uh, so after, like I said, a lot of trial and error and trying to find the best method to use, we had our main components and we could try uh, seeing how well they perform because now we had models, we had something to test, which is also a very important part of this. We needed to test the test data. <laughs> we needed to know whether or not what we had created was good enough. So whenever we actually finished or got a version of a model, uh, what we did was that we uh, first analyzed the generated data we got the statistical properties and then compared it to the anonymized data we had received to see whether or not the statistical properties were the same, whether or not the relationships had been preserved. Uh, and uh, for a couple of the models, the statistical um, properties weren't quite optimal, so we actually had to go back and just uh, find uh, and just tweak our methods and tweak our models and then create a new one and then test again. But when that was completed, we actually sent a significant amount of our data to the end users, or in our case, uh, the developers and the people working on the caseworker system, our contact people, the people we had uh, continuous meetings with throughout this entire process. And doing this uh, ensured that they could quickly find out whether or not there were any obvious faults with our data and using them was much better than us just sitting there and looking at it and saying yeah I think it looks okay. The people we sent it to they are the ones who see this type of data on a regular basis so they knew quite quickly if there were some minor faults that we hadn't seen in our analysis and uh, this I can't this is very important to start this testing process as quickly as possible. The minute we actually have any type of model, we generate a certain amount of data and analyze it and send it to somebody who can give us better feedback on how well it is. So this is also a very part, a big part of the entire synthesis step. And it could be that you have to create several models or the same model over and over again with slight tweaks. But that is the part of the machine learning process. You rarely get the correct answer on the first try, uh, even though sometimes you do and then you're lucky. But sometimes with the benefit sequence, it takes several different tries to find the right machine learning method. Uh, but we did. We found our machine learning models and we created our components that could be used to generalize, generate synthetic data. So then we moved on to our next step. Uh, or the next two steps, because um, two uh, steps four and five are kind of uh, connected. Uh, step four is, of course, to distribute data to the 
uh, necessary systems where it will be used. And step five is to keep it updated because test data is a consumer good. So in synthetic data needs to be updated regularly. Uh, this could just mean making sure that the system has um, regular access to new test data. Uh, or it could be just ensuring that the quality stays the same. So in our case, we decided to distribute the data. We needed a main application that was separate from the synth components. Uh, what this main application will do, it will uh, act as a connector between our synth components, where the synthetic data will be generated, and the caseworker system. So what our main application needed to do was to obtain the synthetic data, and then it also needed to create a synthetic person. Because as I mentioned earlier, there were some non-machine learning components that we still needed to think about. And that was creating this synthetic person with the personal and income information. After the main application has received the synthetic data and created a synthetic person, it needed to connect these two. Because each one of the benefit data needed to have an ID of an applicant. So that was basically create a synthetic person, add the ID to the data. In addition, uh, any personal information or income information uh, we created for the synthetic person needed to be created based on what we generated uh, from the benefits. Because certain benefits could only be given to people of a certain age. So by looking at what we had generated, we could de say, decide uh, what age this person should be. And that was what our main application did. And when the synthetic person has been created, we have the synthetic data. Uh, the data is then formatted or post-processed a little bit and then sent to the caseworker system as needed. Uh, so if you look at this next slide, this was our final solution for uh, this test data need. If you look at the bottom, uh, we have our synth components, which was the benefit sequence, benefit type A, benefit type B, and benefit type C. Each one of these had their own synth component, uh, which created data on demand, basically. Uh, so whenever our main application received a request, it first went and got data from the benefit sequence. It got a random sampled sequence of benefits that was a valid sequence. And then based on this sequence, it queried the other synth components for the uh, relevant benefits. Then when it had this sequence of data, uh, it created a, our main application created a synthetic person, which I said was about creating personal income information uh, based on the benefit data and adding it to the databases that the caseworker system checked. And once that was done, uh, the synthetic data and the person, synthetic personal data was connected, and the data was formatted and post-processed and sent to the caseworker system as needed. Uh, and what we also found out was that the caseworker system uh, actually wanted regular data, so we set up a batch job so that it could get a certain amount of synthetic data every hour. They wanted a lot. And that ensured that the caseworker system always had updated data whenever they needed it. And uh, we had this set up, we sent in data. Of course, there was some back and forth between us and the end users as there were small problems or tweaks that we had to make. So we did our small changes and eventually it worked as it should. It was a good solution, the data looked good, everybody was happy, and we were happy because we had created quite complex synthetic data. We had to connect different types and send it in in correct sequence. Uh, but this was of course not the end of the process because even though this solution worked when, we fin when it was finished, you still need to maintain the solution because changes happen. Uh, and they can be quite big or they can be small. Uh, especially, you know, when you work like I had done for a public part or a public sector, new rules and regulations often occur. 
And uh, what we discovered in this case that sometimes this meant that the test data needs shifted. Uh, it could be as little as suddenly there was an additional column of data that needed to be added to one type of benefit. Or it could be that one value was suddenly invalid if sent in after a certain date. All of these were examples of changes that occurred after our initial solution and after the system was up and running. Uh, so the way we reacted to this was to, whenever a change occurred, we identified the affected component. Because what we had done with our solution, we had it very component-based. This was to ensure that some of the log logic was separated and to make it easier to, again, react to changes over time, which we knew would happen. So whenever a change occurred, we found the component. For example, it could be benefit type A, and then we, it could be as easy as retraining a model because we had still all our code and machine learning methods. So if we got new data that they wanted to be trained instead, we simply trained a new model, stored it, and all the other logic and application would still work the same. Of course, sometimes you don't have the, not, the data needed uh, to train a new model. It could be uh, that the data changed a couple of months ago, so you don't have the necessary amount of data needed for machine learning models. And in those cases, we still found a way to compensate. It could be simply having a sampling methods for the new values or adding a rule that whenever an invalid date was sent in after, an invalid value was sent in after date, we simply sampled a new valid one. Uh, so we had to be a little bit creative. However, because of the components we had, we could still have most of our application working as it should whenever we had to update it uh, based on changes. And it worked very well over time. And um, I think it is the way we base it was a good solution in the end. Uh, so that is my main uh, process for creating synthetic test data and I hope it was uh, easily, easy to understand how we got to where we got. Uh, before I end this talk I would like to talk a little bit about what I hope you got from this uh, and with my key takeaways. Uh, as you might have understand, usually when we are creating synthetic test data, an ensemble of methods uh, is needed. You, you rarely can have only one model and it works for everything. The data is usually complex and there are different types and you have to think a little bit outside the box to find the optimal solution. And again, functional knowledge is required. You need to understand how the system works and how you are uh, how you are going to create your data and what uh, needs to be created. And in addition, you need to test your test data as quickly as possible. When you have generated something synthetic test data, test it yourself, analyze it, get feedback. This again helps you foresee problems with your machine learning models and helps you see how well you are doing. It, it really is a continuous process. Even when you have your final solution, you have your system set up, it is generating synthetic test data as needed. You s there are changes that can occur and you need to react to it. You need to maintain your application, but it is possible to do so. And lastly, about synthetic test data, the most important part is that it is practically feasible. It is possible to create complex synthetic test data that covers the needs of a system. And it really, the positives are endless and it makes the development process so much easier when you have test data that is readily available whenever you need it. So that is my talk. I hope you all enjoyed it and actually learned something today. And uh, maybe you'll see me again sometime. Mm -hmm.